Good morning, everyone. I will be reading from Luke 2, 13 to 14. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. Thank you, Jade. Um, It always strikes me, I'm a little bit in tears, um, how God works in the preparation for things. Um, I didn't tell people to sing certain songs or Victoria to sing that song. And as I listened this morning, um, it just struck a chord with me because a lot of what we were singing just plays directly into what God has put in my heart. And it just reminds me that... um, We're not just doing this by going through the motions. We don't just have someone up here on Sunday to entertain you. Um, We don't just talk about things that are important because, hey, they're good and they're important. Um, God is alive. God is active. God is moving. God cares about the details of even what we talk about Sunday morning. So thank you, God. Um, Now, some of you might be wondering, Wait a second, did that passage that was just read, is that the passage that I hear every year at Christmas time? Does Janelle know that it's September? And does she know, um, did she mean for that to be read? Was that an accident? Well, I want to assure you, um, I do know it's September. And yes, this is often a passage that we hear around Christmas time. But I did intentionally choose this passage this morning. My hope is, that as we explore this passage this morning, Um, you'll understand that there's something very significant that happened that very first Christmas, something that's centered around peace. So beyond the music being selected today that fits in, here's another piece of how I feel God was at work in preparing preparing for this message. A few few weeks back, David Weeb um, sent me a message or an email. Now, David Weeb is the former um, ICOM director, so he used to... um, direct the International Community of Mennonite Brethren. He knew that I would be speaking today, and he wanted to inform me that today was the International Peace Sunday for our fellow Anabaptist believers around the world. Um, Also, this weekend happened to be the International Day of Peace, which was instituted by the UN in 1981. What Dave didn't know when he sent me the message or the email was that the topic of peace had been stirring in my life and in my heart for long before And that was my intention to speak on peace anyway. Um, A few years back, my husband, Andrew, and I, we had heard a sermon about peace during the Advent season following this passage. The sermon seriously impacted our lives and our understanding of peace. And since then, this word peace has been central to our marriage and to our home. Now, it's no surprise that our world is in desperate need of peace. I... I'm in desperate need of peace. Today, as we join with others in talking about peace around the world on this International Peace Sunday, my hope is that here at Westwood, we'd have a better understanding of what the Prince of Peace does in our lives and for our world. So let me just pause here for a moment. Um, You can join me in praying. God, in a world that is marked with war, in our lives that are marked with anxiety, and our schedules that are so busy that we feel frantic, we welcome you. God, we need your peace. There's conflict in our family, in our neighborhood, in our country, in our politics, in our government, and in our world. Jesus, bring your peace, we pray. Amen. So I'd like to get started by doing uh, a little short experiment. What fun is a Sunday morning service if you don't get to be involved, right? So um, we're going to do a little participation here. Um, We want to be all on the same page when I'm talking about peace, and so I'm going to try to get an activity to get us all on the same page. So when we think um, of the word peace, we tend to think of one of two things. This is my assumption here. I'm going to test out this theory, and I could be wrong. Now, I want to invite you to close your eyes or keep them open, whatever you prefer, and picture an image of peace, okay? Picture an image of peace. All right, does everyone have a picture in mind? 
So my guess is that many of you, not all, but many of you are all alone. There's not a soul around you. It's quiet. Perhaps you're in the middle of a great big field, or maybe you're sitting at home in a bathtub and the kids are in bed. Maybe you're lying down somewhere on the beach, or you're standing on top of a beautiful mountaintop, but you're probably by yourself. Now, when we think of peace, we tend to think of this inner peace, a sense of stillness, rest, calm, tranquility. Now, if I were to ask this question to one of the women that I had met a few years back on the Syrian border, what does the word peace mean to you? What does a peace picture look like? She would probably likely say that peace was an absence of war or violence. For her, it was a sense of safety and security. There was no fear in her life when she saw peace, no fear for her loved ones. There was a place where they could stay and live without violence or conflict. Now, this tends to be the two ways that the world thinks of peace. Am I too far off? Did your picture resemble either or some of those two pictures somewhat? On the one hand, we think of an inner peace. We talk about having peace of mind. Um, and on the other hand, we think of an absence of war, destruction, and devastation. And of course, we see both of these things in peace. This is peace. But when we look at the scriptures, there seems to be so much more encapsulated in this word more than an inner peace or a sense of tranquility, and more than the absence of war. It is both of these things, but it is so much more. Now, like I said, the Bible does include both of these things. Those are not wrong. Uh, but the best way to look at the word peace as described in the Bible is to look at the Hebrew word shalom. Now, if some of you are of other languages or you speak other languages, you know that sometimes there are certain words that just do not really translate well. They don't have an English word for this other word that really captures what this means. Shalom is kind of like that. This word shalom, it means a soundness, a wholeness, a well-being. The shalom of God is a life where everything is the way God intended it to be. So if we're having to translate, like I don't speak Hebrew, uh, an English word that we could use, or that I will use this morning, to talk about the sense of shalom um, is the word flourishing. So shalom is when life flourishes. Perhaps the clearest picture of this flourishing life that we can see is in Genesis 1 and 2, before the fall. So before sin enters the world, in the Garden of Eden. That's when God created the world just as he intended it to be. It is here that we see the flourishing of life in four fundamental relationships. When God creates us the way he intends us to be, there are actually four fundamental relationships that we see flourishing. You can take a guess at what some of those might be. Well, when we're created, God breathes his very life into us. That relationship between God and humanity is that first relationship that relationship flourishes. And then there's a relationship with oneself. So Adam and Eve, before they eat from the tree, they know who they are. They're confident in their identity. They're not questioning. They're not worried. Oh, we need to cover up. We need to hide. They are confident. There's a relationship with self. Moving on beyond this, we see uh, a relationship with the earth and with other people. So between Adam and Eve and with creation. So those are the four fundamental relationships that we see. This is the way we see shalom in scriptures. People flourishing in relationships. Flourishing the way that God intended them to be. There's no sense of striving for identity. There's peace with self. There's peace with God. You're at peace with others, and there's peace with the earth that God intended and entrusted us with. So... Peace, this word that maybe we thought is so simple and we understand it, is in fact referring to an ecological flourishing. Peace is referring to a social flourishing. It's referring to a psychological flourishing and a spiritual flourishing. Every single dynamic of life is covered by this word shalom. Now, what exactly does that look like? Okay, so if you turn to, with me, if you have your Bibles, we're going to look at some of the prophets' Um, Prophet Isaiah, what he says, 
the flourishing life will look like when Jesus comes, when the Messiah comes. So if you want to turn with me to Isaiah 2, verse 3 and 4, it's also going to be on behind me. So in Isaiah 2, verse 3 and 4, it says, Many peoples will come and say, now this is the prophet Isaiah. So he is a prophet and he's speaking of when the coming of the Messiah will be here. What is this promised image of the world? Many peoples will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountains of the Lord, to the temple of God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between the nations and will settle disputes for many peoples. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they refrain, train for war anymore. We see here an invitation to a restored and flourishing relationship with God. There's a clear invitation to walk in his ways. It says to walk in his ways. And when we do so, we see a flourishing of relationships with other people. What happens here? Weapons of war are turned into tools that you use to grow and cultivate. That which was once used to destroy is now what? Used to create life itself. It's the promise of the coming Messiah, the coming Messiah, Jesus, that shows us that there will be flourishing relationship with God. From this first restored relationship with God, that is the first relationship. We will begin to come into restored relationship with others, and this picture of peace is promised to us by the prophet Hosea. Moving along, so not much farther ahead in Isaiah, if we turn, just flip ahead to Isaiah 11, verse 6 and 9. So Isaiah 11, verse 6 to 9 says, The wolf will live with the lamb, the leopard will lie down with the goat, the calf and the lion and the yearling together, and a little child will lead them. The cow will feed with the bear, their young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox. The infant will play near the cobra's den, and the young child will put its hand in the viper's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy on all the holy mountain, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the seas. Here we see another image of how shalom, the shalom of God, will fill all of creation. There will be peace between things that are normally in opposition, the wolf and the lamb, the leopard and the goat. Now here's the one that really gets me. I have a little, uh, little boy, little son, and uh, there's no way in this world as it currently stands in its fractured relationship with creation that I would let him stick his hand in the nest of the viper. Right? I mean, would you? Right. Because we live in a fractured world, right? But in this image, it seems to be okay because there's flourishing in this relationship. And finally, let's just turn, I mean, I could go on forever with this, but I will spare you this. Let's just do one more image from Isaiah. Isaiah 35, okay? Verses 1 and 7. So Isaiah 35, verse 1 to 7. The desert and the parched land will be glad. The wilderness will rejoice and blossom. Like the crocus, it will burst into bloom. It will rejoice greatly and shout for joy. The glory of Lebanon will be given to it, the splendor of Carmel and Sharon. They will, be see, sorry, they will see the glory of the Lord, the splendor of our God. Strengthen the feeble hands. Steady the knees that give way. Say to those with fearful hearts, be strong. Do not fear. Your God will come. He will come with vengeance, with divine retribution. He will come to save you. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then will the lamb name leap with the, like the deer and the mute tongue shout for joy water will gush forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert the burning sand will become a pool the thirsty ground bubbling springs in the haunts where jackals once lay grass and reeds and pap papyrus will grow and a highway will be there it will be called the way of holiness it will be for those who walk on that way the unclean will not journey on it wicked fools will not go about it uh, I think that yeah, no lion will be there, nor the ravenous beast. They will not be found there, but only the redeemed will walk there. Now here in Isaiah 35, we see another promise of what will happen when the Messiah comes and takes his rightful place on the throne. Life returns when the Messiah comes. Now we see this picture of physical healing, of bodies that are flourishing, right? The blind will see 
the lame will walk. There's a physical, physical flourishing that's happening. Now, all of this is just to show you a glimpse of this image of shalom. Peace is not just an inner peace, though it is. And peace is not just the absence of war, though it is. It goes beyond these aspects whereby the shalom of God, the peace of God, covers every aspect of life. So I'll say this again. Peace is experiencing human flourishing with God, with others, with ourselves, and with the earth that God entrusted us with. So now that we know this, that question comes, well, how do we live with this kind of peace? How do we enter into a flourishing life both in our own lives and in the world around us. Well, peace is not something that we create. Peace is a gift from God that God gives to only those who let God be God. And I'll say that again. Peace is a gift from God that he gives to those that let him be God. True shalom comes only from God because true shalom is the life, the way God intended it to be. Now, I wish, I really wish that I could say, you know what, I have a really good book or a really good counselor or a really good um, thing that you can do, a class that you can take, a person that you could talk to that would give you peace. And now, although sometimes, don't get me wrong, those things do help bring us closer to peace, but they're not going to give us that true shalom. Now, here's why. The Bible puts its finger on the source of our anxiety and our unrest, our angst, our anger in the world. I believe the Bible shows us the source of our peacelessness. The finger then in the Bible is placed on human beings who turn their back on God's relationship with them. So it comes from creatures who are unwilling to live under the care of their creator. We don't want God to be God but rather we want to be the king or the ruler of our own lives. Now I'm beginning to understand that this is the source of peacelessness in our lives. This, I can tell you with honesty, has been a source of peacelessness in my own life. When I try to do it alone, or if I think I know best, I rely solely on my own understanding, what happens to me? I worry. I become quite anxious. Now, we can say that turning away from God in our lives happens in varying degrees, and it does. Sometimes it's the simplest thing. It's the response, you know what, I just don't want to listen. Or I'd rather choose anger than love because I feel like I have the right to choose anger. Or maybe you just simply say, I'd rather be right than wrong. And other ways that I've turned away from God in varying degrees is perhaps in my laziness and simply that I'm bored or unwilling. And it just kind of turns like this, a slight degree. But regardless of the degree, at the very heart of our human restlessness or our peacelessness is simply a resistance to letting God be God. Here's how I think this works. So when we say no to God, we cause fracture, not flourishing. So there you go. If you're thinking of what's opposite of flourishing, I think it's fracture. When we rebel or we turn away or even become apathetic to life the way that God intended it to be, we're placing a fracture in the fundamental relationship that we were created to flourish in. So for example, when we choose greed, choose greed instead of generosity, so greed would be our choice, generosity being the heart of God, what happens? Natural resources of our earth are exploited for personal gain. This is an ecological fracture. But then greed also drives us to value money over people, and this is a relational fracture. It results in an unjust system in our world. It goes beyond that. If we choose greed over God's generosity, we begin to think that our own worth is found in how much money we have or what we have. Now, this is a fracture of self. And ultimately, greed leads us away from the heart of God, and this is a spiritual fracture. When we turn away from God's way, we're experiencing fracture, not flourishing. Now, you could think of other things. It's not just greed. Um, If you were here a few weeks back, Jason challenged us to think about what? Who was here? He challenged us to think about pride, right? Maybe that's causing fracture. Perhaps gossip or worry. 
Bingo. Worry. That's me. If I'm being transparent, that's a hard one for me. Especially now being a mom. It seems to come with the territory, hey? Didn't expect that one. (laughs) Now, where is worry robbing me of shalom? When we turn away from God, worry begins to settle in. And there's fracture in that very relationship that we're meant to flourish in. Now, I've been challenged lately when we worry, um, I've been challenged to turn to God, acknowledging that my weakness is there and and surrendering that to God, surrendering those parts of my life that I'm trying to control. The enemy of peace is subtle. And the enemy of peace is often very hard to see. But this is the enemy of peace, a heart opposed to God. The enemy of peace is subtle. We experience war in this world. When when our hearts turn away from God, his self-giving love, we experience a war. We experience injustice when hearts are turned from God's concern for the poor and the marginalized. We experience anxiety when our hearts are turned from God's promise to provide. We experience unrest when our hearts are turned from God's invitation to find our home in him. And until we turn our hearts to God, we're not going to flourish. We will not experience that true shalom. This has been true in my own life. So this passage in Luke is so significant because it leads us to how we enter into shalom with God. So I'm saying we need to be at peace. We need to be in restored relationship with God. But how does that happen? Now, the angels here are singing with a language of heaven, this arrival of Christ. Peace on earth. To us, this concept is both foreign and familiar. So that evening, as the world welcomed Jesus into the world, the world was actually welcoming in peace. Side note, I think it's significant here that the angels, the order of that. So what happens? Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace. What comes first? Glory to God, then peace. But the key here, the the central point here is Jesus. Jesus is our invitation into relationship with God, right? That's how we can enter into relationship with God. That's how we can be restored in our relationship with God, through Jesus. Jesus is God's invitation into shalom. It's through Jesus that we can have relationship with God. Jesus is our invitation to lay down our resistance and to simply come home. He can and he will take our fractured relationships and make them flourish as we come to him, as we surrender to him. It's Jesus alone that can heal that disease of our heart. There are things in this world that can help us with the symptoms of our fractured relationships. We all have fractured relationships. We live in a broken world. There's no shortage of them. We can all think of many without too much thought. Here's an example. I'll be real with you. Here's a significant one for my life. I've struggled with anxiety. Anxiety, depression, these things are very real in my life. And this is a result of a fractured relationship with self. Not something I created, but I feel like it's a result of a broken world. It's part of the way I'm wired. This is a very real thing and not one that I think I can just think my way out of or pray hard enough and it will go away. At times, medication has been a source of God's grace and provision. So in essence, I personally have experienced things that help to treat the symptoms of this disease and they do help with the symptoms of our broken world. But ultimately, The fundamental broken relationship that I feel that I have is only restored through a relationship with God. The promise of healing in our lives and of restoration of all things, the restored nature of all things, is promised to us through Christ, if not on earth, in heaven. So we will be healed. It may come on earth, and it will be in heaven. Jesus heals our heart, and if our heart is healed, we can lean into relationships that are healed as well. Jesus is the lasting means to peace. Other things can bring us temporary states of peacefulness, like I've talked about, but these things don't remain. No other person, no other philosophy can give you peace like Jesus does. 
not your therapist, not your massage therapist, not your counselor, not Gandhi, no other political system, nothing, no other religious system gives you peace like Jesus does. There's no walls that we can put up, no peace lines that we can create that will actually give us true and lasting peace as God does. Not the laws, even the laws that we've promised, that we've been promised to give us justice, not even these can give us peace. Only Jesus can give us peace. Why? Why? Because only Jesus can cure the cause of our peacelessness. Everything else and everyone else are simply treating the symptoms of a disease. What the world needs then is a cure for this disease, not just treatments for the system. Treatments are good and helpful, but they're not going to cure it. And what is this disease again? The disease is the heart that's turned away from God. When we step off the throne of our own lives and let God take his rightful place on the seat, our relationships are restored. Our fractured relationships begin to flourish. When we give God control of our lives and when we trust him, we begin to retrieve our identity. We begin to remember who we are in Christ. We know our identity and that sense of restlessness or angst or our need to be something or someone else, it begins to dissipate because we're safe. We're okay. We know we're loved. We know we're seen. We know that we are heard. We know that we are cared for. If you're looking for a one-liner, if you've fallen asleep, if you're someone that dozes off on a Sunday morning, wake up. Here's the one-liner. You can take it away if you'd like. When we welcome Jesus into our life, we welcome peace into the world. I'll say it again. When we welcome Jesus into our life, we're welcoming peace into the world. If you want to experience peace in your life and you want to see peace in the world, then we need to begin with this question. Where am I resisting God? Where are we following our own desires and our own priorities and where are we not letting God lead in our life? Where are we not letting God simply be God? And when we discover these roots, it's not some big complicated process and 20-step plan to get back on track. All we need to do is lay down our resistance and Jesus invites us home. Isn't that beautiful? Like, what beautiful news. We have this gospel message that is so beautiful. Perhaps that's why they call it the gospel or the good news. Or it's often referred to as the good news or the message of peace, the gospel of peace. So we too then, just as Christ was sent out to bring this good news, we too are sent out as agents of peace in this world. We are sent out to wage shalom, not to wage war. No matter where we are, it doesn't matter. Every single person here, it doesn't matter where you are, where you've come from, how close or how far you feel from God. When we invite Jesus to be Lord or to have control in our lives, we will experience shalom, not only in our lives, but in our relationships with others and with a relationship with the world around us. Now, this is a movement that I want to be a part of. Honestly, my heart deeply longs to see the world restored. And if my heart deeply longs for this, how much more does the heart of the Father long to see every dynamic of the created world restored? It's not just your own relationship. It's a relationship with the person beside you, relationship with your family, relationship with those that you have discrimination against or that discriminate towards you. Relationship with the earth, a flourishing with the world, this beautiful creation. It's so majestic. My heart longs for this. What a gift that we can see glimpses of peace on earth as we welcome Jesus into our world. So I want to end this message by saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth, shalom. Let's pray. God, I thank you so much that you love us. I thank you that you care about the state of our relationships. That you care about me, you care about my brothers and sisters in Christ, you care about our church, 
You care about the church, your bride. God, forgive us when we try to do it on our own. God, forgive us when we turn our back on you and say, you know what, we got this, God, and we cause fracture. God, please help to heal our fractured relationships, God, in our own lives, in the lives of our family, our friends, in our church, in our world. Help us to see where we are resisting you. And help us to press in, God, press into um, the relationship that you have offered to us. We thank you, Jesus, for the sacrifice that you made so that we could be at peace. We could experience true shalom. And God, we celebrate and we praise you. We sing glory to God on highest, knowing that one day in heaven, all things will be as they were meant to be. They will be restored and beautiful and they will flourish. We give you glory in Jesus' name. Amen.